Well, greetings, church family. Uh, I'm glad you are uh, joining uh, this recording of our next uh, Corporate Sunday School lesson, uh, where today we are continuing our study of the topics in Wayne Grudem's book called Christian Beliefs. We're looking at basic and essential uh, truths from the scriptures uh, that define us as Christians and uh, define what God wants us to believe for our life and godliness. If you're visiting with us today, again, very happy that you're uh, tuning in. Um, and uh, feel free to contact Three Rivers Baptist Church in Irmo, South Carolina, uh, with any questions you might have. Uh, we'd appreciate hearing from you. Um, today, our topic is, uh, who is Christ? And again, there's so many things we could say, but in this short time, uh, following uh, Wayne Gruden's outline, his two main emphases are the fact that one, the Bible says Jesus is fully human, and two, Jesus is fully God. And then I'm going to add a third uh, uh, element to our outline. What is Christ? What does the word Christ mean? It kind of begs the question, what does it mean for Jesus to be the Christ? So Jesus is the Christ, God's anointed king over all creation. So the first thing we want to talk about is the fact that uh, Jesus is fully human. Now, think about this. This is, uh, this is a wonderful thing, and it's, there's a mystery to it. But we've studied the Trinity in the past, remember, there's only one God, but he exists in three distinct persons, not three manifestations or not three roles, but three distinct personalities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And from all eternity, this second person of the Trinity, the Divine Son, uh, in eternity past, um, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, was a Divine Spirit being. In other words, Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God the Father never had, uh, never will have, a human fleshly body. Um, what he, he, who he is is a divine spirit, as is the Holy Spirit, as has been the divine Son in eternity past. But... Uh, in the creation of time and in the time of our creation and the fullness of time, not at the very beginning of creation, but in the fullness of time, roughly 2000 years ago, um, God created a human body and soul for his divine son. Um, think about that. Uh, now, from now on, from 2000 years ago on, now the second person of the Trinity has what he never had from all eternity past, and that's a human nature, a human body and soul. By human nature, we're saying um, he has the capacity to experience what human beings experience, express, react, act as human, uh, act. Um, so, for example, the Bible says, God is he who neither slumbers nor sleeps. Well, until the second person of the Trinity became human, he never slumbered or slept. But now, as uh, within his human nature, he has the capacity to experience getting tired. He has the capacity to experience needing sleep, uh, getting thirsty, etc. So what, what the Bible is teaching is, uh, and here, here's a wonderful way of putting it, uh, the late theologian uh, John Murray uh, this is a succinct and well-stated sentence, but you almost have to say it twice and really let it sink in. Think about this. The incarnation, this, the, the, the word carnal comes from the Latin meaning flesh. I'm talking about human flesh here. So when Jesus took on uh, a human body and soul, the incarnation means that he who never began to be in his specific identity as son of God, began to be what he eternally was not. Jesus eternally in the past was not human. But he who was never created, who was always the divine son of God, 
now became 2,000 years ago what from eternity past he never was. And that is not only fully God, but fully human. Now let's look at the scriptures uh, where the Lord reveals to us the full humanity of his divine son, Jesus. And the nice thing about this being recorded is if I move through this uh, quickly and you, you say, oh, there's a verse, what was that verse? Or I'd like to look at that a little closer. You can just stop the recording and, um, and, and backtrack and go and look at it again. So let's, let's quickly move through what God has revealed uh, about his divine son being also fully human. We read in Matthew 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. Uh, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus's conception was miraculous and mysterious. Somehow the Holy Spirit caused her, a virgin, to conceive a child in her womb. So the conception was extraordinary, but then once conceived, Jesus's gestation period in the womb, his developmental stages within the womb were all ordinarily human, uh, the same as yours and mine uh, had been. Joseph took Mary as his wife, but he kept her a virgin, virgin until she gave birth to a son. So here's this gestation period, typically nine months in the womb where we're developed. Jesus went through that, and then she gave birth to a son, just like birth was given to you and me. So um, <clears throat> he went through all these developmental stages ordinarily as a fully human being. We see in Luke 2... Uh, the child continued to grow and become strong. So he developed physically, just like you and I have. Um, he also developed mentally and in his soul, increasing in wisdom. Uh, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature, so physically and mentally in his soul. We see that in John 4, that Jesus experienced being something he never experienced before he became a man. He, he, he got tired from, from walking from, from on a journey, and he got thirsty. Uh, he said, give me a drink. Um, a striking verse is 2 Corinthians 13, 4. For indeed, he was crucified because of weakness. Now, don't misunderstand. This weakness here is not referring to any lack of faith or spiritual weakness at all. What is the weakness being referred to? It's the weakness of a mortal body, a body that can die, a body that can be killed, which did happen to Jesus. That's why he could be crucified. That could have never happened to him before the incarnation in his uh, divine nature, but in his human nature, in his human body and soul, he had the capacity to experience the weakness of suffering death. Um, we see that when Jesus saw the faith of a Gentile centurion, centurion he was astonished. He could say, wow. Um, we see in, in, that in Isaiah 53, he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Uh, Hebrews 5, 7 says he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And when Jesus approached the tomb of, of his friend Lazarus and he saw the people crying around the tomb in sorrow, we, re, we see that he was deeply moved in his spirit and in his spirit and was troubled and he wept and he cried. When he saw a leper who came to him asking for help, he was moved with compassion. So he felt pity for uh, the physical circumstances of people who were suffering. More importantly, in Matthew 9, 36, he felt pity over the spiritual circumstances with which people were suffering. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. When religious leaders obstructed people 
uh, obtaining the grace of God from laying hold of God's grace. Uh, he became anger. We read in Mark 3, 5, after looking around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. We see Jesus was able to experience rejoicing in his God, and regardless of his earthly circumstances. Uh, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit, we read in Luke 10, 21. And this same kind of joy he's able to give to us human beings to experience. When he says in John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy might be full. Some people might get the impression, well, because Jesus was divine, because he was God, he really doesn't know what it's like to suffer some of the circumstances that we suffer. That's, that's hardly true at all. It's, it's not true at all. We read in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Now look at this. One who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Um, <clears throat> I want you to think about this. You and I will never experience the full weight of temptation that Jesus did. I'm going to say it again. You and I will never know what it's like to bear the full weight of a lifetime of temptation the way Jesus did. Now you might ask, well, why is that? Now think about this. Every time you and I give way to temptation and sin, we break before we bear up under the full weight of it. Uh, <clears throat> some years ago when I was preaching, uh, some of you here might remember, I took two cinder blocks and I set them up and I took one of these thin wooden yardsticks and I stretched it in between. And this represented you and me. And then I put my foot on the yardstick and I, I lowered it, lowered it, lowered it. And the point is the yardstick broke before it even came close to knowing what it was like to bear the full weight of my body. And then I took a plank and I had the name Jesus written on it, a solid thick plank, and I put it on the cinder blocks. And then I got up and I stepped on it, and I'm standing uh, in front of you on top of this plank, and it's bearing the full weight of my body. Uh, that's uh, an illustration of you and me versus Jesus. Because you and I have sinned, continue to sin, we never know what it's like to live a lifetime of bearing up under the full weight of the temptations that come upon us. Jesus is the only person, the only human who knows what that's like. So if we're ever tempted in our sufferings or in our discouragement or in our perplexity to say, yeah, but, but you don't know what it's like, Jesus. No, actually, Jesus has a right to say to us, no, you, my, my brothers and sisters, you don't know what it's like. I do. So... Um, that leads us to, a, to an important, ask another important question. Well, why is it important for Jesus to be fully human? And there are several reasons. We'll, we'll touch on some here. The first is right here uh, in our text in Hebrews 4.15. He's able to be a sympathetic high priest representing us to God. Um, he's able, he ex God knows everything. He's omniscient. But Jesus uh, experientially now knows uh, what it's like to be human. Uh, he has experienced that actually more fully, what it means to be human, than you and I ever will. He had to become fully human to be our merciful, substitutionary, representative high priest unto God. Look at what Hebrews says. Since therefore the children, now this is talking about not all human beings, 
but the children who have become children of God through a spirit-generated faith in the Lord. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, you know, a human body and soul, he himself likewise also partook of the same. Verse 17 of Hebrews 2, he had to be made like his brethren, his brothers and sisters in all things, in all things. He had to be. Why? So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to represent us to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And this word propitiation refers to Christ by the offering of his body in death upon the cross, satisfied God's justice, paid the penalty and paid the ransom price for the guilt, not of his sins because he knew no sin, but the guilt of our sins. He died in our place for our sins. He satisfied God's righteous wrath and justice. As 1 Peter 2.24 says, and he himself bore our sins. See, he represented us when he died. He bore our sins in his body. He needed a human body to represent the human race. In his body, on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. You see, Christ came to redeem all those that God had given him had chosen to be objects of his mercy and grace and to make them, by identifying with them, create them as brothers and sisters to Christ and as children of God and to create a new humanity from the old humanity, um, to take uh, an elect remnant of this sinful human race and cause us to be born again into a faith in him, whereby we have union with Christ through faith. And therefore, Christ being God, we have union with God the Father. So we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. And uh, earlier in, uh, we read in... Uh, uh, in Adam, in union with Adam, all die, but in Christ, all will be made alive. The last Adam, and that's Christ, became a life-giving spirit. So he had to become fully human to represent us to God, to remove God's righteous wrath from us, to procure the Holy Spirit of the crucified and risen Jesus, to regenerate, recreate our hearts, cause us to be born again with a new bent, a new attitude, a new heart to God, whereby we put our faith in Christ, cling in union to Christ, and become part of this new humanity that will inherit uh, the presence of God in the new heavens and earth forever. That's why he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in all things. He had to become fully human. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, what he was willing to do to bring us to God. Uh, as Peter says, Christ suffered in the flesh the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. Now, um, the second major point that we want to talk about is this very same person, not a different person, this very same divine person, Jesus, became fully human, but he was, as he has always been at the same time, fully God. As the angels announced to the shepherds in Luke 2, for today in the city of David there has been born to, for you a Savior who is Christ, and who is Christ? Not a Lord, the Lord. He is God. As Christ's Apostle Paul writes in Colossians 2.19, For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity, all the fullness of God dwells in bodily form. So he was not only a man, he was the God-man. Not half God, half man, 
fully God, fully man. We see in Romans 5, and there are many texts that talk about the divinity of Christ, the fact that Christ is God. Uh, speaking of uh, the Israelites, from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, that is in bodily form, who is over all who? God blessed forever. After his resurrection, one of his disciples, Thomas, said, I can't believe he was resurrected until I touch his body. You know, I put my hands into the side, his side that was pierced, in, into the imprints in his hands, and then Jesus appears. And then we read in John 20, 27, And then he, Jesus, said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas at that point answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. He recognized this fully human Jesus to be fully God. And notice Jesus, one might say, well, that was Thomas's opinion. Notice Jesus is going to affirm and confirm and commend Thomas's opinion to us. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Believed what? That Jesus is Lord and God. This fully human Jesus is himself fully God. Now, <clears throat> that again begs a question. Why is it important that Jesus was fully God? Well, why couldn't Michael the archangel, a loyal archangel, God could have created a human body and soul for him. And if he had lived a sinless life on earth, why couldn't he have died for the sins of humanity? Well, there are many ways, again, uh, we can answer this. <clears throat> um, Michael, would have, Michael would have brought himself into fellowship us as brothers and sisters with hold on here a second brothers and sisters with an angelic being but we're brothers and sisters with a divine christ but <clears throat> also it was important uh, for christ to procure a ransom for our sins um jesus said in matthew 20 28 the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life, to offer his life sacrificially as a ransom for many. And the many are all the children whom God gave Christ. Um, <clears throat> a ransom uh, is a payment uh, to release someone from prison or captivity or to release an object from the possession of another and uh, so this is what we need to think about. <clears throat> we see this word ransom in Greek is lutron. Um, <clears throat> in Numbers 35, we read, If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death at the evidence of witnesses. Moreover, you shall not take a ransom. And in the uh, Greek translation, LXX, uh, is, a, is a Greek translation, the Septuagint. In the Greek translation of this Hebrew word ransom, we have this same word, lutron, a ransom. In other words, if I would kill someone, I can't give you uh, 30 pieces of silver and say, okay, let me go free. God says, no, there's nothing you can pay as a ransom when you murder someone. That goes back to Genesis 9, 6. If anyone kills a human being uh, by, by humans, his life will be taken for in the image of God. God created human beings. All human life is so sacred, being created in the image of God, that <clears throat> we can't fix uh, a material price on that, like a house or a car. That would devalue the God whose image we bear. And so think about this. Every time we sin... Every time we sin, um, we devalue God. In other words, we say, well, <clears throat> I could either take my own vengeance or leave room for 
the vengeance of God, which, which we're told to do. Um, which is more valuable? Uh, or, or we could say, I could either you know, get on the internet and look at pornography, or I could be pure in heart like God is. Uh, which is whichever is more valuable to me at the time is what I choose to be. And so if I choose my pornography, um, I'm saying uh, my uh, internet pornographic sites are more valuable to me than Jesus, more valuable to me than God himself. Well, that's a horrible attitude to take toward the creator. And the question is, <clears throat> God is a God of justice. He not only requires punishment for our sin, but a ransom payment, restitution for our sin, uh, restoring his honor. Um, the commandments in Exodus were all all emanated from this very character of God's justice. If a man lets a field or a vineyard be grazed bare and lets his animal loose so that it grazes in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. If a fire breaks out and spreads to thorn bushes so that stacked grain or a standing grain or the field itself is consumed. He who started the fire shall make restitution. Do you see the fairness of God? And isn't that a beautiful thing? You know, if, if someone um, smashes your car, you know, takes a rock and smashes your car window, uh, car windshield, isn't it only fair that an that a earthly judge would, uh, if you had to go to court, would say, <laughs> you, the smasher, has to make full restitution. You have to replace that windshield and maybe some other compensatory damage for your inconvenience. You see, these laws are just emanate from the very character of God who is a fair and just judge. Now, <clears throat> here's the question. When we sin, we choose to say what well, my sin is more valuable, be being my sin is more valuable than being like God. So we devalue God. Well, how valuable is God? How much is God worth? Well, God's worth is infinite, isn't it? It is. There's no measure to his worth, to the value of his being. Um, so here's what we human beings try to do after we sin. We try to provide our own ransom price, our own restitution to God by saying, well, <clears throat> I think my good works that I do will out weigh my bad. And I'm just pleading with anyone who is still thinking that way. You, that's like pouring gasoline on the already white hot fire of God's wrath for you. You're making it worse. You're, you've already insulted God by your sin. Now you're insulting God further by saying your value is no more valuable than the value of what I consider doing good for others. Are you kidding me? I'll put uh, an extra thousand dollars in the offering plate. If God would accept your thousand dollars or my thousand dollars as compensation for a sin I committed in which I devalued him, God would be devaluing himself. He would be saying a thousand dollars me equivalent. God will never devalue his glory that way. In Isaiah 42 and verse 8, God said, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. I won't give the glory of my value to a thousand dollars or to a car or to a house you might provide and come or to anything you yourself might be or do. I will not devalue myself and give my glory to another. Well then, what offering can be given to God to make full restitution, a full ransom payment to restore the honor of God, which we have devalued by our sin and devaluing him. You and I have nothing. 
And that's why the wages of sin is death. The most valuable thing we do have is our own lives created in the image of God. But even that is not equivalent to the infinite value of God. And that's why those who die in rebellion to the Lord spend an eternity in hell. When sinners spend an eternity in hell, that actually bears witness to the infinite value of God because we can never stop paying. That's why we're not simply annihilated as some people would, would wish. And if I were an unbeliever, I would wish that <laughs> annihilation. <laughs> But that's not the future of those who don't put their faith and trust in Christ. We will, we will spend eternity in hell bearing witness to the fact that we can never make full restitution to the infinite value of God we devalued by our sin. There is one and only one who can make full restitution, make uh, fully pay the penalty of our sins and the ransom price for our sins. It had to be a man who could represent us and yet be God himself. Who is that man? That is the man, Christ Jesus. We read in Hebrews 10.10, 10, By the will of God, Hebrews had said just previous to that, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Behold, it is written in, in the scroll, I have come to do your will, O God. That's prophetically speaking of Jesus's willingness to come and be a man and provide that only acceptable offering that would restore us to God. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Christ once for all. It had to be God blood that was shed for our sins. That is the only offering God could accept and not devalue himself while justifying us through faith in his son Jesus. Isn't that marvelous truth that God has revealed to us? God give us eyes to see hearts to love what we see of Jesus and a will to embrace him as our Savior and Lord. And that brings us to the third and final point. And we'll just briefly make a point here. Jesus is the Christ. Well, what does it mean? It means he's God's anointed king over all creation. Here's what the Bible teaches us about the meaning of the word Christ. Here, uh, one of the disciples uh, uh, found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. And since John was writing his gospel to a largely Gentile church, they didn't all speak Hebrew. Uh, the Hebrew word Mashiach, we transliterate Messiah. But Messiah, which translated means Christ. Christos is the Greek, which John's readers were reading. Christos, which we transliterate Christ. Just very quickly, the Hebrew word Mashiach, which we, we, don't, we, we transliterate, we make it sound in English like it sounds in Hebrew. We transliterate as Messiah. We translate, its meaning is anointed one. You see, the practice in the Old Testament was when God had his prophets anoint someone as king in Israel, they would take olive oil and they would anoint the head as Samuel anointed the head of King Saul. And later, God's prophet Samuel anointed the head of, kings, of, of David to replace Saul as God's king. So um, there were many Mashiachs of Israel, Saul being the first one, David being the second one, Solomon being the third one. And it, so to be a Messiah means to be anointed as God's king over his people. When Mashiach is translated into Greek, it's Christos, and into English, that's Christ. But the Greek word Creo also means to anoint. It means, Christ means anointed one. So what this means, uh, and you can see how this is used uh, in 
the Old Testament scriptures. First Samuel 26, 9, but David said to Abishai, as they walked into Saul's camp when everyone was asleep, and David had a chance to kill Saul, who was trying to kill him. David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's Mashiach in the Hebrew and in the Greek translation of 1 Samuel 26, 9, guess what the Greek word is? Christos, Christ. You don't stretch out your hand against the Lord's Messiah or the Lord's Christ. It refers to God's anointed king. But <clears throat> so in other words, Jesus is the name of the Son of God who became incarnate, but Christ is his title, the Messiah. He is God's king. And when Jesus, 2,000 years ago, came to earth, there was no king reigning over Israel. The Romans had, uh, were occupying Israel. But the people of God were hoping for what God had promised 700 years earlier in Isaiah uh, chapter 9 with verse 6, that a child would be born to us, a son will be given, and notice this, the government will rest on his shoulders. His, he will be a ruler over God's people. And among his names, we'll see mighty God. In other words, this is no ordinary Messiah like Saul or David. He is a divine king. And notice, there will be no end to the increase of his government or peace, the wellness of his kingdom. In other words, this divine Messiah will be king over all creation. There are no boundaries to it. And he will be a descendant of David on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and how, for how long? Forevermore. And that's the kingdom that we hope to inherit uh, through faith in this Messiah who is Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah. Nathaniel, one of his disciples, recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. You are the Son of God, the King of Israel. And in Matthew 16, 15, when Jesus asked his disciples, I know who other people say I am, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are heaven's King. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Um, why do you, if you're a believer, or I believe that Jesus, the divine Son of God, fully God, fully human, has been crucified, risen is now reigning as heaven's king and it will return one day to bring consummation and bring all things into subject to god the heavenly father if we truly believe a faith that will not be shaken it's because the holy spirit god the holy spirit revealed this to us we can't prove it scientifically but we know it even more certainly because the Spirit of God is bringing that, us that conviction. Pray that God would ever keep us convinced of who Jesus is. And if you're not, pray that God would bring you that conviction. You see, when we receive Jesus by faith, the, the faith by which we're justified, regarded as righteous in, in God's eyes, forgiven of our sins, is a faith that receives Jesus for everything he has revealed himself to be. He is fully God. He is fully human. He is the only acceptable offering for sin by his death on the cross that God would accept as payment for our, as, 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 as satisfying God's justice for our punishment and satisfying God's justice for our ransom, making full restitution to his honor, which we have devalued by our own sin. There have been controversies in the past. They will continue. I remember back in the 70s and 80s, professors at Dallas Seminary, uh, Zane Hodges, Charles Ryrie, were arguing you can accept Jesus as Savior without receiving him as Lord, as King, as God's Messiah over, over uh, our lives. 
And then, of course, they would debate John MacArthur and say uh, on this. But it wasn't just John MacArthur. It was Reformed Baptists like Walter Chantry. It was, it was Reformed theologians. You see, we have to understand um, Jesus said uh, regarding his kingship, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Uh, the faith by which we're justified is, is a faith that trusts in Christ's sacrifice. Uh, for us, Christ merits and not our own, but also pledges loyalty to Christ as king, to Christ as Lord, to, to pledges loyal obedience to him. That's what it means to receive Jesus, not for some of what he is, but for all of who he is. And then for us who do this by God's grace, we have this promise. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the authority, to become children of God, to inherit the presence and glory of God with Christ our brother, in the new heavens and new earth forever. May God give us eyes to see this Jesus. May he open our hearts to receive this Jesus for the great God and Savior that God has resurrected him to be. Let's pray. Lord, open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things about Christ, about you in your word. Open our hearts to love what we see and receive him whom we see, your only begotten son, Jesus, our great God and savior, your Messiah King, in whose name we pray, amen.